Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, got everybody back, and the coffee cups, I guess, are nearly empty, so we'll get back into Hosea chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 1, and my little wife is reminding me that this is book 70. For those of you out in television, I think it's the middle four programs, right? Middle four programs of book 70. Next taping, we'll finish book 70. And you know what? This is our 16th anniversary of tapings. We started in October of... 1990. So it's been uh, 16 full years of uh, tremendous blessings. Who would have ever dreamed? I, I just shared with my brother on the way up this morning. We can remember almost the place on the Muskogee Turnpike when Iris and I said, well, surely this won't last more than six months. Because <laughs> that's what we really thought it'd be, about six months, and it would die a natural death, and uh, then our television experience would be over. But here it is, 16 years, and the Lord has been blessing. And again, for all of you out in television, we just want to welcome you to a just simple Bible study. We, uh, we try to keep it simple and yet uh, hit some of the things that you normally don't see and hear in Sunday school. All right, Hosea chapter 3. We'll just start at verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me. Now remember the word Lord, and when it's capitalized like this, is really Jehovah. And I read a good article again the other day, a gentleman that I respect highly, and he had all the reasons why the word Lord is Jehovah, and Jehovah is Jesus Christ. He's God the Son. All right, back to the text. And so the Lord said, <coughs> Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend. Now, you remember back in chapter 1, he said, go and get a woman. <clears throat> so what we have here is, is two different attitudes. Instead of just simply claiming a girl for his wife, now he's going to go back and win the law wife that had left him to go back to her lovers, all right? <clears throat> so he says, go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. Honey, can you bring me my, my cup? No, oh, just bring me a cup of swallow. <clears throat> All right, while I have a swallow of uh, some cough medicine, I got a tickle, I want you to go back to Jeremiah 44. No, I got one. It's in here. Okay, I made cough medicine out of my coffee. <laughs> okay, go back to Jeremiah 44, and uh, <clears throat> you'll see what I'm talking about. I might come back here again even later before we get through Hosea. But Jeremiah 44, and uh, let's just use verse 19, because I'm going to use some of the other verses later on. Jeremiah 44, verse 19. Now this again is the response of idolatrous Israel. Jeremiah 44, verse 19. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven, now that's the female goddess, usually Astarte, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, we did make her, what? Cakes. Cakes. Now, the better translation from flagons of wine would have been grape cakes. In other words, they actually took a, a grape-flavored cake and offered it on their altars to this female goddess. See? So here's where we get the comparison of Scripture. We made cakes to worship her and poured out drink offerings unto her. All right, back to Hosea then, once again, chapter 3. <coughs> So these Israelites, now you've got to remember that when we speak of Israel, it's the ten tribes in the north, but the prophet also includes Judah and Benjamin. So the whole twelve tribes come under these prophecies. All right, so back to chapter 3, verse 1 again. So the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to 
other gods and love grape cakes that were made of wine to be offered to these goddesses. All right, verse 2. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley, a half omer of barley, and I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Now remember, he's talking to that who had once been his and has now been lost, and he's bringing her back. All right? And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be for another man, and so will I be also for thee. Now, of course, I think what's implied here, Israel was so steeped in idolatry all the way up until the Babylonian captivity, and that cured her. I don't think there's any evidence that the Jews practiced idolatry after the Babylonian captivity. Now, they had a lot of other wicked acts and so forth, but not idolatry. For some reason or other, it cured them of it. All right, and so this is what he's referring to, see? And that she would come back for a time, and she's going to completely be removed from idolatry because that's her return after she's been out in that Babylonian 70 years of captivity. <clears throat> and now she comes back and, and is at least cured of the adulterous spiritual adultery of idolatry. And now God says, and I will be also for thee. All right, now then here we come to chapter 4, and this is prophecy in, in a veiled form. For the children of Israel, the nation, shall abide many days. Now watch this carefully or you're going to miss it. The children of Israel are going to abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Now, the casual reader is going to miss all that. What are we talking about? They're going to be bereft of all their temple worship. They're going to be out of the land. They're going to have no formal ritual to keep them in touch with the God of Abraham. All right, when did that all come about? In 70 A.D. Because what happened in 70 A.D.? The Romans came in, and again, they destroyed the temple, but so much differently than when Nebuchadnezzar did it, because when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the, table of the temple, 70 years later, the Jews came back and rebuilt the second temple, and they came on again with their temple worship, with their priesthood, their sacrifices, all the way up until the time of Christ's first advent. But when Titus came in, and destroyed the temple, and destroyed Jerusalem, and the Jews were scattered out into every nation under heaven, and it's been that way now for 1900 and some years. They're without a temple, they're without a priesthood, they're without a prince, they're without a sacrifice. They are destitute of any kind of a religious practice that will keep them in touch with the God of Abraham. All right, now that's what that one verse is telling you. All right, now then, what's the first word of chapter 5? Afterward. Okay, now i got my timeline on the board, miraculously. Turn around, and <laughs> there's my timeline. Okay, so here we come. We're coming out of the call of Abraham at 2000 B.C. From Christ back to Abraham, 2,000 years. All right, about 500 years after Abraham, we've got Moses, brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, down to Mount Sinai, they receive the law. Then there's another 500 years between Moses and the appearance of the priesthood and the, and the tabernacle until we come to King David. Now when King David appears and the kingdom begins to expand and prosper and they start defeating all their enemies and Israel reaches the glory that they had never had before, and even though Solomon increased it a little bit, that was the time of Israel's glory. 
and they still would refer back to it. Uh, now, this is the way I teach. I can't help it. Come back up with me to Acts. Just come back up to Acts. And then I'll go back to my timeline. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And the Lord has just completed his 40 days after his resurrection. He's been with the, the 11 in that resurrected body. And now they are meeting on the Mount of Olives. And in a short order, he will be ascending back to glory. But now in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. This is why I happened to think of it when I spoke of Israel's glory. When they therefore were come together, you all got it? When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, in other words, the eleven are asking the Lord Jesus up there on the Mount of Olives, just before he ascends, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the what? The kingdom to Israel. See, that's Israel's hope. Even today, if they have any knowledge of Scripture at all, they know the Messiah will still come and bring in this glorious kingdom promised to Israel. Now, of course, the 11 did not have the view of it as we can construct from Scripture, but they merely knew that it'd be a kingdom likened under David's and Solomon's when Israel was the most glorious kingdom on earth. Now, have you got that? Okay, so now then, when you come back here to Hosea chapter 3, when we talk about afterward in verse 5, now I want to come back to my timeline for a little bit. After King David and Solomon, and then we go another, like I said, uh, Hosea and Isaiah are prophesying at about 700 B.C. Then by 600 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar comes in, destroys the city and the temple, takes the Jews into exile for 70 years. All right, then after that, they come back and once again restore temple worship. At about 400 B.C., the Ezra temple is rebuilt, and uh, then they continue on, and then I guess I'm jumping ahead of my timeline here. But after the minor prophets are finished, which will be from Hosea to Malachi, then there's 400 years where Israel has not a word from God, not through a prophet, through nothing, until the angel appears to first Elizabeth on the birth of John the Baptist and then to Mary, the appearance of Christ. All right, now then we call that his first advent, and the whole thrust of his ministry was what? to prove to Israel that he was that promised Messiah and King. My, I'm stressing it constantly. That was the purpose of all his miracles, to prove that he was this promised Messiah. All right, but now let's back up where, again, in Hosea chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 4, I'm going to read it again. For the children of Israel, the whole nation, not just the two tribes in the south. We got all 12 tribes involved. The children of Israel shall abide many days, which we now know is over 1,900 years, without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod. Now, see, that was all associated. I trust you know the language here with the priesthood. And without a teraphim. And then... Afterward shall the children of Israel return. All right, now then let's just go pick up some prophecy. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now in all my teachings around the country for the last month, different cities, the first thing people were asked, well, you know, what's happening in the Middle East? Where are we? with regard to the end time. And so over and over, I would just say, well, let's go back and see what Jesus meant when he said, you can discern the signs of the weather, 
when the sky is red, you know, tomorrow will be a fair day and so forth. <coughs> but what was the last part of that statement? But you cannot decipher the signs of the times. All right, so what are our signs of the times? Prophecy. All right, here is the clearest one, and uh, I think it's the one that is referred to back there in Hosea that we just read. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass. Now remember, this is Moses. 1,500 years before Christ. That's 3,500 years back from our day. And he says that shall come to pass <clears throat> when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind. Now here's the key. When they are where? Among all the nations. When the Jews would find themselves scattered into every nation under heaven, none accepted, even the Arab world, all had Jews in their midst. And it wasn't until about the turn of the century that they started getting forced out and back to their homeland. But at the time that verse 1 is speaking, they were in every nation under heaven, none accepted. So this was fulfilled to the last jot and tittle. But now look at the next verse. When Jews find themselves in every nation under heaven, then it wouldn't be long until they shall return. You see that? Now that's exactly what Hosea says. After they've gone that long time without a temple, without a priesthood, without a sacrifice, afterward, they're going to come back. And that's the beauty of prophecy. And that's the number one reason we can rest that this is the Word of God, because Israel is back where prophecy intended them to be. No other book on earth can do that. I was dealing with a Muslim young lady again the other day. And that was my number one point. I said, don't you realize that our Bible foretold the Jews would be scattered all around the planet, and then the day would come, they would be back in their homeland against all the odds? But there they are. The Koran can't do that. The Book of Mormon can't do that. Any other book of religion that you know on the face of the earth can't do that. This is the only one, but here it is. This was all in God's providential design that that's the way it would happen. And now here they are. They're back in the land. All right, let's look at a few other verses that we use quite often. <clears throat> Jump up to Ezekiel, chapter 36. And my goodness, it's plain English. Even in the translation, <laughs> it's as plain as it can get. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Got to wait till you find it. Otherwise, my listeners will write and say, Les, you go too fast. I can't find the scriptures. I can't write my notes. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Where God again, the Lord God up in verse 23. The Lord God says, for I will take you, that's Israel, that's why I'm always emphasizing, to whom is this written? Well, it's written to Israel, not to the Gentile world. And so he says to Israel, I will take you from among the heathen and watch the same language that Moses used in Deuteronomy, and I will gather you out of how many of the countries? All of them. My goodness, there were Jews in Persia. There were Jews in Iran. There were Jews in Iraq. Not anymore, because they've all been pushed out. But before all this happened, there they were. I read again the other day, they found a Jewish synagogue clear up in northern Siberia. 
where they had no idea a community of Jews had ever existed. In fact, a few of them were still there. They were scattered to the ends of the earth. Now, read on in verse 24. So I will gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Now, in that plain, why can't our government people see that? Why can't the United Nations see that? Instead of trying to oppose, they should be working with God. But you see, that would never happen. <laughs> Things just wouldn't work right. But nevertheless, here it is. God has spoken it, and we're seeing it happen right before our very eye. Now I think I got time enough. I'm going to just slip over into chapter 37. It's been a long time since we've done this. I think way back when we first taught Genesis or someplace back there, Ezekiel 37, honey. And uh, we'll just start at verse 1. We're going to take the time because, like I said, it's been a long time. And this is all prophetic that we are seeing happen right before our eyes. The hand of the Lord, verse 1, was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Now remember, this is symbolism. Just like we've been talking in Hosea, Ezekiel's the same way. This is not a literal valley full of bones. It's a symbolic valley. Verse 2. And caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many bones in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. What does that mean? They've been there a long time. You know, if you drive across West Texas and you look out over the prairie, you'll see an old uh, skull of a steer or something laying there, and it's chalk white, and you know it's been out in that old West Texas sun for years and years. The longer it lays there, the whiter it gets. Well, that's the bones in this valley. They've been there a long time. Now, in actuality, over 1,900 years because the bones are representative of Israel out in the Gentile world without any of her homeland advantages. See? All right, verse 3. Now he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? They're chalk dry. They're white as snow because they've been out there for so long. And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said unto me, Prophesy or speak upon these bones and say unto them, O oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord unto these bones. Now remember, they're representative of the nation of Israel. O oh, ye dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Now verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God, not Ezekiel, the Lord. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. You shall live. I will lay sinews upon you. That is upon these dry bones. I will bring up flesh upon you. Cover you with skin. Put breath in you. And you shall live. And you shall know, when they've been brought back to life, you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now remember, this is all in symbolism. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh. In other words, it's a slow process, but the nation is going to be reappearing because that's what we're talking about now, the nation of Israel coming back to life. And they came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath, no spiritual life. Then said he unto me, Prophesy to the wind and say, Son of man, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds. In other words, from every corner of the planet. Come from the four winds, O breath. Breathe upon these slain that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived, stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, that's all symbolism. Bones that have been out there, symbolic of the nation of Israel, out amongst all the nations of the world, and God's going to bring them nationally back to life by returning to the homeland. And we've seen it now for the last hundred years. Not that you've lived a hundred years, but some of us almost. But nevertheless, we've been seeing it happen. Here they're coming, and nothing can stop them. My, I had an interesting letter the other day from a fellow. No, a phone call. It was a phone call. I told him, I said, man, I could talk to you for 24 hours. He had been designated. He was a fairly, fairly high naval officer. And after World War II, he was given command to take his Navy cruiser and two troop ships, and he was to go to a, core, a, a port in Greece, I think Thessalonica, and he was to load those two troop ships with escaping Jews and escort them back to Israel. <coughs> and he was telling me this on the phone. Oh, I only got a minute left. So anyway, he got it all done got those ships loaded with hundreds and hundreds of Jews on each one and escorted them down the Aegean, across the Mediterranean. And as he was approaching Israel from the west, the British Navy attempted to intercept him, which, of course, they'd been doing. So he fired a couple shots across their bow and radioed them that if they wanted a fight, try and stop him. And he's going on. And so he sailed on into the, ho uh, the port of Haifa, with his two shipload of Jews. And he said, there was the biggest thrill I ever had in my life to see those Jews embarking into their homeland. But see, it was against all odds that the Jews got back to their homeland. But they did. And you and I know every day's news is a guarantee that God kept his word. They're back home. Oh, there's still two-thirds of them out in the rest of the world, mostly in America and Canada and so forth. But the prophecy has been fulfilled that after being scattered into every nation under heaven, they're back in their homeland. So don't ever buy the propaganda that they don't belong there. They should never give up one foot of land. It's theirs. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.